Deer found her. As you know, there's no blueprint for entrepreneurship. You wear so many hats, you burn the midnight oil, you pour your heart and soul into everything that you do. But without a doubt, the journey is worth every single second that you put into it. I'm Lindsay Pinchuk, host of the Deer Found Her podcast. I say this because I've lived it for over a decade. I started my first company with $500 in my pocket and a baby in my belly. I grew it and I sold it all. This podcast is my weekly letter to you. We'll talk all things starting, growing, nurturing, and in some cases, even selling a business. Together with some of my closest contacts, I'm here to help you find your own success, whatever that means to you. The ride as a founder is the ride of your life. So come on in and join me for another episode that will get you one step closer to reaching your own founder goals. Welcome back to another episode of Dear Found Her. Today, I'm talking to Sally Holder, who's made it her mission to help other women and specifically to help other women make more money. Don't we all want that? As we move into March and Women's History Month, I couldn't imagine a better story to kick us off than one which supports women in making history for themselves. But before we get into today's episode, I'm your host, Lindsay Pinchuk, and I've been building brands for nearly 25 years. With a $500 investment, I founded, built, and sold a seven-figure business that reached 3 million people per month. In this podcast, it's my twice-weekly letter to you to inspire you to find success through your own entrepreneurial endeavors. Really and truly, this podcast is the show that I wanted 13 years ago when I became a female founder. And so if there's really, if there's anything that you want to hear about or that you want me to share, or if there's anything I can do to help you, I invite you to reach out. If you're inspired by today's episode, I invite you to share it. You can text it to a friend. You can share it in your stories. You can tag me at Lindsay Pinchuk or at Dear Founder because I absolutely will come and say hi. And as always, if you like what you're hearing, we would love it if you left a five-star rating or a review wherever it is that you podcast. That's how other entrepreneurs discover our show and discover the incredible stories that we share here each and every week. So today's guest, Sally Holder, is an absolute rock star. She is the founder and CEO of The Brim and the Beyond Rock Middle Movement. Her passion for helping women, you will hear it coming out of your earbuds. She is a passionate leader who thrives on helping female entrepreneurs to realize and ultimately achieve their true potential. She's so dynamic and passionate, and she has the uncanny ability to uncover the real things holding business owners back, even when they may not be aware of them themselves. Sally's unmatched holistic coaching style has fostered a resilient and engaged community of like-minded entrepreneurs that help to empower each other. And you're absolutely going to want to follow at the brim, which we'll link in the show notes on Instagram. As you hear us talk about in today's episode, USA Today named Sally's book, Hitting Rock Middle, as one of the top rated books that will change your life and business in 2021, which is a huge, huge, huge acknowledgement. After you listen to today's episode, mark your calendar because tomorrow, Sally and I will be going live for International Women's Day on Instagram at 11.30 a.m. Central Time. But for now, come on in and meet Sally Holder. Welcome back to another episode of Dear Founder. I'm very excited about today's guest. She and I met on Instagram, which is kind of just like a it's not a new thing, but it's definitely like a newer thing for me, right? To have all of these amazing contacts and connections and amazing female founders that I have met over Instagram and then have gone on to have incredible conversations with. Sally Holder is the founder and CEO of The Brim and the Beyond Rock Middle Movement. And I love what she's doing because she supports female founders in it just in the biggest way possible. And we had a conversation on her podcast a few weeks ago. You should absolutely listen to it. If you haven't already, we're going to link it in the show notes, but we're going to continue the conversation here today on Dear Founder. So Sally, welcome. Thank you so much for having me, Lindsay. I'm excited to be here. In fact, you should definitely listen to that episode. I just got a message from one of our listeners saying, that it is one of their very favorite episodes and they had been binging the podcast and they just were raving about the woman from Bump Club. And I said, oh my she God. is just a fantastic person. So I Thank had to you share for that. Thank you for sharing too. that. 
Mm -hmm. That makes so me nice so happy. Hear. But it's yeah. it's so fun when you get to continue these conversations, right? Like, I, like I've done a couple of pod swaps and it just makes so much sense to hear the other side of the story. And I'm so excited that we're doing this. So thank you. Yeah, me too. Me too. So tell us a little bit about your background. Get us up to speed. I want to know how you got to where you are today. I want to know what is the brim and what is the beyond rock middle movement? I mean, there's a lot of things to unpack here. So I'm going to give you the floor. Take us through your history. Okay, yeah, sure. So, um, you know, right now, I always tell people what I do is I help make women more money. And the reason why I start with that is that I practiced law for 10 years doing labor and employment litigation. And I had the opportunity to work with some of the largest companies in the world. But when I went to bed at night, I just wasn't feeling that sense of fulfillment that I wanted to feel. Um, you know, I think that we all know what I mean by that, right? We're all in search of actual contentment. And, um, you know, I jokingly say, but it's true, you know, I didn't sleep better at night knowing that I saved FedEx a million dollars, right? It was lovely. It was a good thing, right? To win a case or to, you know, have a situation go our way, but it wasn't leaving me with, with that level of excitement. And so I knew I came from a family of entrepreneurs and that, you know, I had the entrepreneurial bug. I just wasn't really sure how it was going to play out for me. And, um, because everyone kept offering me the opportunity to go and start my own law firm, right? And I find when we choose a career at the beginning of our lives, right? I was 24 when I started practicing law, that everyone tries to keep you in that particular box. And I didn't want to stay there. So, um, you know, I continue to push back on that entrepreneurial adventure, um, believing that I wouldn't have another one and I just couldn't figure out another way. So eventually I had the opportunity to be uh, the chief operating officer of a law firm. So that ended up being my nice foray outside of law. And um, once I did that, I really realized, gosh, I like running companies. I my degree was in organizational development, human and organizational development, actually from Vanderbilt. And so I had this, you know, love of companies and organizations. And now I had all of this experience with the employer employee relationship, that it really made sense to run a company. So I did the COO thing for about six years, with six different companies over that period of time. Um, and then I had a female founder actually come to me and say, hey, would you coach us instead of coming on board with us full time? And I really didn't know anything about coaching at that time. Um, you know, as you can imagine, when you're an attorney, coaching is not something you're offered very much. Um, neither is mentorship. Um, at least it was not for me in this really large firm that I was in. Um, and so I was intrigued by the concept. And that's how I ended up in coaching, I started doing one-on-one. -on -one, and then I realized, gosh, you know, I would sleep better at night. I This is where I've been meant to be all along. And, you know, everything we do leads us in, I believe, a better direction and has this right thread of continuity. And um, all of those experiences led me to where I am today to start the company and um, the brim, meaning I think that we as women collectively are better off working together towards this big overall mission of helping women own a space of multi-million dollar companies. And I just had this firm underlying belief that the world would be a better place if more women had more money in their pockets. And so it's built upon that idea and that foundation. And, and we do um, provide a revenue accelerator program. So the intent behind the company is to really accelerate female founders' revenue to get them to be seven-figure founders. And there are specific strategies and tactics associated with being able to do that. So we teach you exactly how to do that. Hi, guys. It's me, Lindsay. I wanted to tell you about HoneyBook, the new tool I've been using to automate my business. 
This past December, I felt that things were a little bit disjointed. My coaching and consulting contracts and client acquisition process wasn't automated. And honestly, I just kind of felt like a mess. And then someone introduced me to HoneyBook. They're the leading client flow platform for independent businesses. And it's what I use to make my client acquisition and payment processes as easy as possible, not just for me, but for you. HoneyBook allows me to manage my workflow and my client experience, streamlining all the steps that it takes to sell and deliver my personalized services. By combining tools like billing and contracts and client communication, HoneyBook helps independents get organized and provide top-tier service at every step, and I have loved it so far. The best client experiences truly are built on HoneyBook, and I am totally sold. You can check out the link in my show notes and give it a try for a dollar a month through February 27th. So when someone comes to the brim, what can they expect? Because there are a lot of things that you offer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what we like to do is have an introductory call. You know, I think it's so important for us to find out if there is a strategic fit. You know, um, we want to work with you know, women who are excited about creating that seven figure growth. And that generally means that you are looking to put in a certain amount of hours, you likely are looking to hire, you're looking to create systems and processes. And not everyone wants that, which is fine. We just want to be the avenue for the women that do. And to tell them, you know, there are a lot of other coaches out there that specialize in the startup and the very beginning phases, and they specialize in helping you create a great side hustle or something just, you know, that is only on social media. And I found that there was this real lack for the very serious female founder that wanted, you know, the strategies, like I said, and the tactics that, that gives them that full roadmap to building out that long-term business um, and achieving this this bigger vision that they have. So, um, you know, I wanted to develop, you know, a system and a methodology that I could deliver to them that I knew would produce results. And so I've developed that roadmap and we deliver it in this 12-month coaching program. So, you come in and we have an initial call to make sure that we're a fit and that we give you the right information um, and that you're ready for that type of growth, um, that that's what you want. And then if you are, then because we don't want you to waste your money or your time, right? I mean, two of the most valuable resources you have And so we want to make sure we can give you exactly what you need and deserve as a female founder, because we want more women in business long term. So um, so I'd like to go back to kind of when you made that shift over to starting the brim, because I think that that is really the... The, like it's a sticking point for a lot of female founders when they're going from this job in this career that you don't know, oftentimes it's more than a job it's a career that they've known for many years it's all that they know and they think they want to do something else and they're not quite sure but they have an inkling and you know they might have an epiphany but a lot of people get stuck with how to make that shift And so how and when was it that you were able to really switch off the career of, you know, Sally as an attorney to Sally as the founder of The Brim? Yeah, I mean, gosh, that was such a hard transition Um, for so many reasons, right? That was my identity, right? And we, you know, take on the title of our Um, jobs very often as a big part of our identity. So, um, you know, I ended up, this is what I ended up writing a book about um, called Hitting Rock Middle. And what I realized was that there was a middle place where you can very much get stuck, where a lot of people identify with you serving in one box, one role. um, And Oftentimes, you're seeking something that looks radically different because you realize that's not giving you what you thought it would. Um, And so I started by, it sounds so simple, but we just stopped doing it at some point um, by dreaming again, right? So um, 
you know, I let myself believe that again, anything was possible that, you know, if I threw absolutely everything in the middle that I had done and believed and thought I was, and I got to only remove the pieces and parts that I actually wanted to keep right now, right? The 35 year old version of me was so different than the right 24 year old version right? If I pull out now only the parts that I really want to identify with at this point in my life, they're different and that's okay. We're going to change. And I hope they're different because I'm going to grow along the way. And, um, I couldn't find an exact roadmap of how to get out of that place because everybody kept coming back to me and being like, Oh, you must be so happy because you're successful. And I was like, but I'm not. I'm miserable. And I felt like there was this secret I was keeping and I couldn't find anybody else that would talk about the fact that I could simultaneously be externally successful and internally miserable. And to me, that's exactly what rock middle is. And I, in the book, wrote out exactly the roadmap of getting out of that place. Um, with a lovely acronym of Be Boulder. And that all started with beginning to dream again. Yeah. And somewhere along the way, I had found I had made some decisions about what was possible and what wasn't. And all of those decisions were actually just feelings, right? I was caught up in what other people would think. I was caught up in, you know, my perception of success and titles and all the things. Um, but the great news I can tell you after surviving it all is none of that stuff is true, right? You can reinvent yourself at any point. And, um, you know, I'm so grateful that, that I have now, which is, yeah. So what other people I need think to hear, that the I think. advice to, to start dreaming again is amazing advice, but it's one thing to dream and it's another thing to act. Right. So mm -hmm you decide you have, you have this idea and you want to make it a business. How do you do that? I mean, how do you, how do you, de how do you decide you're going to cut the cord and you're going to start this business? And where do you get your first clients? Because you need clients if you're going to make money. Right. So, you know, I like to think of it as a roadmap of your life, right? You would never get in your car and start driving and then be like, I hope I land in a cool place. No, you would actually build out exactly how you're going to get there. And you would start out with your destination. And that's what I tell people all the time. You know, had I gotten really clear about the vision for my life and the destination that I wanted to create, then I probably would have let myself off the hook of practicing law a lot earlier. Um, and by creating the destination, I mean, you need to have two really critical goals, right? You need to have income goals, and then you need to have lifestyle goals. Those two things, A plus B equals C, which is the fulfillment. And most people only make income goals. They do not make lifestyle goals. And by lifestyle, I mean... How often do you want to be working? What do you want, you know, Fridays to look like? Do you want the flexibility and freedom? Do you want, you know, control of your schedule? What creates true success in terms of your lifestyle? Um, and I did want freedom and flexibility, which does not work very well with a, a judge and a courtroom um, and a scheduling order. So, um, you know, had I thought through those things, I would have realized, gosh, it's far more than a title and money. Um, and so I tell people, create that first, right? And make sure that you have that destination. Once you do, then it's going to tell you, okay, then if my income goals are, let's say, 100000 and my lifestyle goal is to work, right, three days a week on this, um, you know, while I build up a client base, then you can begin very small and ask yourself one simple question, which is, okay, what's the next step, right? That's it, right? We get very overwhelmed because we then want to know how we're going to reach that destination. But once you know where you're headed, then you can put everything through that particular filter saying, okay, does this help me get closer to that place or does it not? 
Um, so you're asking yourself, does this next step, does this next action lead me there or does it not? And at least then you are developing right that true roadmap along the way. Um, I think this quote really sums it up well, which is be clear on your destination, but fluid on how you get there. How is going to change, right? You can come up with the best map in the world, but things are going to come up. People are going to cancel. Conversions won't happen when you thought they would. And that's okay. But in, if you're fluid and you're okay with that, then you realize you can survive because you're still headed where you want to go. I want to know how you got there because you like, how did you convince people that you were the, that they should buy your services and they should sign up to work with you? You were a lawyer. I mean, yes, you were the CEO of a law firm and, and whatnot, but there's still something to be said about making that shift and convincing people that you were providing them with a service they couldn't live without. So how did you get there? Yeah. Um, great question. I mean, one thing that women especially have to invest in is their own confidence, right? We've got to understand the value that we bring to the table. And, you know, I always say, do some research, right? So that's exactly what I did. I got my hands on every single book out there that I possibly could on coaching, on scaling a business. And I didn't start out with a particular specialty or, um, you know, I started out working with female founders that um, wanted one-on-one -on -one coaching and guidance on making that initial career transition. So it was something that I had just done right? The, I had just built that particular roadmap. So I felt very confident about my ability to guide them through something I just experienced. So, um, you know, I would say, look at the value you can bring to the table, begin by just making a list of all of the things that you have done and have accomplished um, over the course of your career, you will realize that your experiences hold a tremendous amount of value and that there are other people that are coming behind you that need to know what you just experienced. And a lot of, like I said, my beginning, you know, career was about sharing that journey with them, helping them make that particular transition because I got it. I was, you know, in there with them in the same exact way. And oftentimes too, what you'll find is all you have to do is be one step ahead of where the rest of your clients are, right? You know, you don't have to be 15 steps ahead. And oftentimes if you are, then you can't remember, right? You're not close enough to it either emotionally or, you know, you can't remember just how hard it is or you can't identify with them. So it's not a bad thing that you aren't, you know, 15 steps ahead and, you know, you have it so scaled that, you know, you're barely involved in, you know, exactly where the, the clients are. So I, I recognized my own value. I made a list of what I could offer. I got really clear on what the problems were that other people were experiencing. And then I began to talk to other people, right? I, I always say, make a list of your 10 low-hanging fruit and start there. Just get yourself out of there and begin having meetings. Talk to other people about what they're struggling with. Ask questions, you know, make notes about the problems other people are experiencing. And then figure out, right, what the combination is between the value that you have, right, that experience and the problems they're having. And there is overlay there, right? You have had experiences that can solve the very problems they're having. And then you figure out how to present it to them in that way. How long did it take before you got your first client? Oh, gosh. Um, I would say it took a good five months right? It took a lot longer than people are willing to give it today. They want to reach out to 10 people, have it instantaneous success and determine right away whether they can or cannot pursue this. And that's not how it goes, right? At all. I really appreciate you saying that. And that's something that I am, that as I am a year into this phase of my career, am going to be starting to talk about a lot more because when I left Bum Club, I, I Bum Club became my client. So I was really lucky, right? Like I had this built in client already and they were my client. And then I, I randomly got a connection that I got a second client. And, you know, I had this one other client and but then it was you know, like kind of slow moving. And I had like a few clients at once, but like 
it, it, it was, it took a while and it's taken a while for me to get to a point where I like am now choosing what I get to do. You know, at first I felt like I was just taking everything because, and I was doing it and doing it well, but one, I wanted to get the experience of different projects and working with different types of people to see what I liked the most. Right. And that was like a, yep. the first thing. And then the second thing was that, you know, it was, it, 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 I, I couldn't, I'm trying to figure out the balance between doing the work for the clients and putting myself out there. So there's that piece of it as well. And now I'm at a point where I'm getting a lot of inquiries for my services and I'm able to say, okay, well, I think I'm going to do this and I'm going to maybe not do this, or this isn't a fit. And it's, and I'm picking the projects that I want to work on now. And I'm, and I'm helping the people that I want to help. And I, I appreciate you saying that because it doesn't happen overnight. No, it doesn't. You know, I always tell clients, you know, entrepreneurship and especially creating a seven figure business is a lot like, you know, survival of the fittest, right? It's just those who are willing to continue to come back and iterate, right? You find out what you like, and then you realize, gosh, there are still parts of it that I don't like, and I want to incorporate this piece. And now let me go out into the world and try to service that client again and see how it goes. And then you realize, oh, wait a minute, I don't want to serve men. Let me cut that out. Now let me realize, well, what portion of the female founder's business do I really feel most passionate about? Right. And you continue to whittle it down and refine and refine and refine over time. And, but the biggest piece of advice I could give, you know, new founders is just pick a niche and start, right? Pick a lane and stay in that particular lane. And you can always change it. But where I see people go wrong, especially at the beginning, is they attempt to serve everyone in an effort to try to gain as many clients. But what they don't realize is, right, when you stand for everything, you stand for nothing. And therefore, you are not going to attract prospective clients to you as quickly as you would if you just planted your flag and you said, this is all I do. I do this one thing. I do it really, really well. And that is one of the things that contributed to the quick growth of one-on-one coaching at the beginning was ultimately I realized, ah, okay, it is niching down. It's being very specific. I only serve women. I serve women who are making the transition from corporate to the entrepreneurial environment and wanting a roadmap to do that. So once I realized this is exactly how I need to talk about what I do, and I was able to differentiate myself in that way, then people were able to refer me. So that is when word of mouth began to grow. And then that is when my client base began to grow as well. This is such good advice for everyone who is listening. This is such good advice. And I am, I am also a testament to that as well. Like when I first started, I was like marketing consultant and it was too much. Like, yeah, you know, and even my best friend said to me, like, I know, you know how to do all this stuff, but you can't really do all this stuff. You know, I mean, it can come in bits and pieces throughout the work that you're doing, but when you're putting yourself out there, you have to be specific. And she was right. And you were right. And what did I do? I said to myself, what do I love doing? What do I want to do? You know, and I love to build community. And so now I help people build and monetize community, period. You know, and like that's that's one sentence. How do we do it? Social media, emails, content. I mean, all those things come into play. But I build and monetize communities. And that's that's what happens. And and you get bottom, bottom line growth from that. And so thank you for saying that, because I also think that so many of us are, you know, to your point, want to show up and be everything to everyone. And you find more success when you niche down and when you are very specific about what it is that you do. Yes. I think, you know, I don't want to get on a long tangent about this. I just think that especially for our female listeners, there's a tremendous amount of fear around saying no, um, that, especially to anyone at the very beginning stages, because they're worried that that will give the impression out to others or in the world that they are not likable. And let me be the first to tell you that it is the exact opposite. You know, women have been conditioned for a really long time and told in order to be well-liked, you have to be pleasing. You have to be nice. You have to be kind to everyone, say yes, and all of that. Well, let me 
tell you in the business world, which when they taught us those quote unquote rules of the, of the game, um, how to be likable, they didn't ever expect that we would be business owners. They were never putting it in the context of the business world. And so in the business world, in order for you to create that very critical no like, and trust factor, you can't say yes all the time. In fact, it is the exact opposite. The more often you say no, right, the more likely you are creating this perception that you are in demand, that you have um, a, a very, you know, well-oiled machine. You have a great understanding of what you do well and what you don't. And all of those things exemplify that you are a professional. And that's what we need to understand very much as women that saying no, even at the beginning, is absolutely a good thing and will not destroy your likability for the future. I love that. I, and, and and I couldn't agree with it with you more. So thank you for saying that. Hi guys, it's me, Lindsay. I'm not sure if you're aware, but over the last nine months, I haven't just helped big enterprise brands on their marketing efforts through my consulting firm. I've also helped over a dozen women, small business owners in launching their companies, building their brands, and to tweak what wasn't working. I've been building and growing brands for nearly 25 years, but I've forever used one method to build my own brands and that of my clients and students. My signature suite method utilizes social media, your website, emails, events, partnerships, and publicity to generate and execute cost-effective community-centric marketing strategies. If you're looking for that added layer of guidance, please reach out. There's a link in my show notes. Book a call with me and let's see how I can help you. I can't wait to meet you and learn about your business. Now back to the show. I want to kind of get into the Beyond Rock Middle movement and how that came about and where did that, like I, you expl- you talked a little bit about it at the top of the conversation, but when did that become a thing? How did that become about and how did you decide to write it in a book? Yeah, well, when I started writing the book, I was so frustrated because like I said, I couldn't find a roadmap where someone was saying, okay, when you have a successful career, this is how you transition out of the mat and slowly but surely create an entrepreneurial journey. Like, where is that book? I couldn't find it. And so I told myself, if I ever actually make this full transition, I am going to show other people how to do it too. Um, because it, it is like a seesaw, right? At the beginning, you are very... Um, you know, uh, all of your revenue or income at that point, not revenue, but income is coming from your full-time job and you're starting something slowly. It's just a seed, right? You're beginning with your dreams and then you're beginning to get action oriented and hold yourself out. And it starts with one client and it builds from there, one client at a time. And you switch the seesaw then to begin to slowly let go and pull back on right? Maybe the income that you have in your corporate world, you you begin to transition maybe to a little bit more part-time and then pulling back and, you know, slowly flipping the other direction to your reliance on your entrepreneurial venture for your income and your revenue versus your full-time job. And everything that I could find in the marketplace all talked about you're you're at the bottom of the barrel, right? You're at rock bottom and you need to pull yourself up. This is how you get started, right? Or it was, you know, this is how I created my $100 million company and sold it, you know, for a billion. And I was like, where is the middle ground? What's in the middle? And, um, you know, so I figured if I could create some terminology around that middle then maybe more people would talk about it because there's got to be more people out there that feel like I do. So um, I wrote the book. It came out, Lindsay, in January of 2020. So So, you were probably uh, getting ready for a uh book tour when Mm -hmm. COVID hit. Yes, I was on the book tour. I was in Minneapolis March 14th. I will never forget when I got a call and they're like, you have to fly home. And I'm saying, why? And they say, your kids are out of school for the next two weeks. And I'm thinking, oh, this will be a lovely break from the book tour. I have 22 more cities to go to. Um, so I'll take a two-week break and then I'll come back. 
because I had let go of all of my one-on-one coaching clients in advance of the book tour, because again, I'm always about them having the best experience and that wasn't going to give them a great experience. So here I was, no book tour, now no revenue because I have no clients and I'm sitting there thinking, oh gosh, I'm at the beginning again. What am I going to do? So what'd you do? Um, so I went went for my, you know, COVID hiatus. And, you know, as any good entrepreneur does, I say, if I'm starting all over again, then I can create anything that I want. And what I really wanted, much like you, you know, were so passionate about, what I really wanted um, and had learned from the one-on-one coaching is that I wanted to be surrounded by other women who were great go-getters as well. I wanted to find other women who believed what I believed. And I wanted, um, you know, so many of my one-on-one clients would say, this is so great. I just, I want to know that other people are doing this as well. And I would tell them stories of other clients of mine, but it wasn't the same. So um, that's when, you know, I came up with the idea that it would be a movement and that, these would all be women who would raise their hands saying, you know, I want to move us collectively as women together in the direction of having more seven figure female founders, right? As soon as I knew that the statistics were that 98% of us never reached that seven figure mark, I was like, well, that's just appalling. And, you know, we can do something about it. And so if we all get together, then we can do it together. And and that was the idea that if we created a group coaching program that pulled everyone together, they could experience together, have less loneliness. It's always the one of the things that entrepreneurship is the worst, uh, you know, about is experiencing that loneliness and especially during COVID. So um, yeah, it really kind of took off from there. Um, a lot of women raised their hand and said, yeah, me too. I don't want to be alone in this, but I want to create something big and amazing. So I want to point out to everyone who's listening, even though it's going to be in the show notes that USA Today called Sally's book, a top book that will change your life in 2021. And that's a really big feather in your cap. So congratulations on that. First of all, thank you. I mean, that's a really big fucking deal. So it it is. I want to say that. Definitely um, cried tears of joy that day and was like, oh my gosh, it's this real. This is amazing. And so I like I would love for you to like, yes, you have the group coaching, you have the one-on-one coaching, you have the book, but like what can people expect when they pick up your book? Why does it change you know, people's life? I think the number one comment I get from strangers is, wow, you were incredibly vulnerable. Um, because it is not just a superficial how-to overview at all. I tell my entire story um, about the fact that I did use alcohol throughout my journey to numb the pain that I was experiencing along the way. Um, you know, what we tend to find is that people have to be in enough pain in order to precipitate change. Um, And that was exactly what happened to me. And for a very long time, I wanted to ignore the pain. And the best way for me personally to do that was through alcohol. And so there were a lot of things that I had to face and had to challenge myself on, like, is alcohol getting in my way of, you know, evolving and growing? And I had to realize it was. So you know, during this whole journey, I got sober, I completely changed my approach to life. And so, you know, I talk about all of that really in depth, and honestly, about my worst, darkest days. And, you know, just, I hope that that shows people that, you know, you can experience some bad things, and they may be self inflicted. And, you know, if you experience any shame around those, I get it, I was there. And, but it doesn't have to hold you back forever, right? At some point, we can make a choice to turn them into, um, turn them into something great. Um, and and so I think it's the vulnerability that I hear most about. And I talk a lot about that. Um, I, you know, that's something that I talk a lot about. That when you put your shit out there, it's like mm-hmm. a magnet that brings people to you. And people don't want to be working with some person who's like perfection. You know, they, they want to know you're human. And when you show your shit, 
people gravitate towards that because that they have shit too. Right. And so, Oh my God. So true. You know, and and it's like, I, I didn't even realize at the time with bump club, right. Like that I was like, Oh, like, you know, my ankles are fat and swollen and like, Oh, I have gestational diabetes. But then like, I would talk about it and people would be like, Oh my God, you know? And so, but it's like, it's like when you talk about the things that no one talks about, I do think it propels you into a level of success and connection that you probably didn't expect. Oh, so true. Like I had no idea that it would resonate with people in the way that it has. I mean, just to even get to see how many women now are entrepreneurs because they read the book, like to see physical, like brick and mortar locations that I know that I even got to play a small part in is, uh, I mean, I have chill bumps right now. And I think too, uh, you know, we have to keep sharing the shit, right? Mm -hmm. Because it does keep coming. It's not like, oh, you figure it out and you get to the top of the mountain and you get to stay there, right? There's always going to be a different hill to climb. And there are going to be a lot of peaks but there are going to be a lot of valleys too. And, you know, I experienced another one this year, right? I got divorced this year. It was the hardest thing I've ever been through, worse than sobriety. Um, And, but I experienced the most personal growth and we can only go professionally where we're willing to go personally. And if we're willing to really challenge ourselves personally to, you know, face things that aren't serving us in whatever way, shape or form, or that, you know, we're willing to get really honest about the fact that, you know, we just haven't been showing up in the way that we should, or that, you know, we can't do it all, then that's the starting place. Not That's not the end. That's, that's when you begin to see the growth and, and experience of things that you want, just like you were saying. I mean, I think that we have to keep talking about the fact that all of this is going to keep coming. You just get better at handling it, right? It's like a workout. Like, yes, your muscles get stronger. You know how, oh, yes, I recognize this. I remember this feeling again, and I'm going to make it to the other side. Um, because you always will, right? Yes. You you survive 100% of your most awful days. So I'd love for you to share a little bit about where the brim is going because you just recently announced some exciting news and you've really grown this brand, both the brim and the movement, the rock middle movement to, to, to encompass a lot of different facets and a lot of different revenue streams. And I think that's important too, because you don't, to your point before with like the COVID example, you know, you want to have different options because you don't want all your eggs in one basket. You never know what's going to happen. So I'd love for you to kind of share now where you guys are headed because it's not just one-on-one coaching. It's not just group coaching. It's not just your book. You have a lot going on. Yeah. So, you know, I'm really proud of the expansion that we've had. I'm always looking at, you know, again, where are female entrepreneurs, where are they getting stuck in this particular process? So, I did develop a few um, online courses that I love. And I just literally this morning, Lindsay, finished a um, sales program, sales course. Doesn't even have a name, but good Lord, we as women hate sales. So I was like, I just want to tackle this beast. And so we have a lot of self-guided tools now that need to be some people's entry point into this world of coaching and what it looks like just to get help, right? Um, And then that can open them up to realizing that getting help isn't a bad thing. Um, So, you know, we have those available on our website now, which I love. Um, And then, you know, I'm so excited that we have just added three new full-time coaches that are going to be coaching um, one on the West Coast in California, one in Florida, one in New Jersey. And so that's going to really help us be able to serve more women. Um, You know, I really was at max capacity and I'm thrilled and that'll help us serve different time zones, right? It's just more about there are more women out there to reach. And so 
um, thrilled about that. And then um, I'm going on a little road show this um, fall. So that's very exciting. We have I think we've announced three cities, but I know that we have 16 set. So, um, yep, there are a lot of locations that we're going to over the course of this fall. And I'm sure that we'll continue that um, because, you know, making that one-on-one in-person connection is so important, um, you know, to building the trust that people need in order to begin to be vulnerable about the help that they and the support they need. So, I'm going to be doing those myself personally and leading people in those workshops around the country. So I'm thrilled about that. Um, And that will help more women see that they can participate in, right, one of our online courses, one-on-one coaching or the TRA, the Revenue Accelerator Program. So um, all of that going on. And then, of course, the podcast, too. So um, busy, busy lady. I wouldn't have it any other way. Um, I'm really excited for you. Congratulations. Thank you so much. Today's episode is brought to you by Hivecast, an amazing agency providing high quality podcast production made simple and affordable. I hit the jackpot when I came across Hivecast as I pieced together services from contractors all over the web initially to help me with my podcast. Hivecast was everything that I needed all in one place. For just $500 per month, they not only produce and edit four episodes, but they also create the marketing assets. Emma, my account manager, is amazing, making sure that I'm on task and that we can schedule episodes regularly and by my deadlines. Honestly, the time saved working with Hivecast is worth at least triple what I'm paying. Their sister company, Fireside, offers other marketing services for small businesses, including social media management, Facebook and Instagram ads, search engine marketing, and so much more. Again, all at a rate palatable by a small business owner. The best part, there's no contract. You can purchase their services as needed on a monthly basis. Use the code FOUNDHER and save 50% off your first month of services. Give them a try. The decision to outsource this part of my business has surely saved me a ton in the long run, and it was the best decision I've made for my business. So before we wrap up, I want to ask you what I ask everyone, and that is three actionable tips that you would give female founders who are, you know, just starting out, or maybe, maybe they've gotten a little, their feet wet a little bit, but they're stuck. Like, what would you tell founders? I would first say the antidote to fear is clarity every time. So continue to remind yourself that anytime you feel, you know, quote unquote stuck, Most of the time, that is a feeling driven by fear. And that can be cured by you gaining clarity about what it is you want to create and where it is you want to go. So go back and reconnect with your vision and then come up with a day-to-day strategy on how you're going to get there. Um, The second tip I would give founders is Sell, sell, sell. (laughs) You know, 80% of your time at the beginning, especially, but, um, you know, really 80% of your time ought to be spent on selling, 20% of your time on executing the rest of the work. Now, people freak out about that statistic, but, you know, selling is a very big, expansive term. And so, networking, connecting with people, following up with people, right? Spend a tremendous amount of your time and put that at the forefront of every single day. It takes more time than you think it does. And it always will pay off if you keep at it, right? Remember, people tend to convert after their fourth interaction with you, um, sometimes up to seven. So you can see that the runway needs to be long. um, And that's why you have to keep after it. Um, And that probably, I guess, goes into my last tip for all of them would be track your actions. There is no way that you are going to remember it all. So start early and often with tracking your um, sales actions, right? Who do you have an intention of working with? And pick out 10 each and every week and move them through your um you know, particular sales process with warming them up, following up and attempting to convert with that, you know, convert them. Um, But track it, you will not realize that 
part of the problem is you just haven't reached out to that many people and you've got to reach out to 10 to even remotely give yourself a chance of success. And oftentimes when I come back to founders, I say, how much time have you put into this? And they say very little. I'm putting all my time into creating content or being on social media or all of that. And I'm like, that's just an awareness tool, guys. It's not a conversion tool. It's just awareness. You've got to sell to convert and to make money. We cannot forget the sales piece. So get out there, do it, stay committed, and you can make it happen, right? It's just survival. Sally Holder, founder and CEO of The Brim and the Beyond Rock Middle Movement. Thank you so much for being here. I These tips are amazing. You have given me a lot to think about, so I appreciate it. And I'm so excited to see where this goes, and I can't wait to catch up with you again soon. Thank you so much for having me. There are so many takeaways from today's episode. And if you follow Sally and sign up for her newsletter and everything that she has to offer, you will continue to receive these nuggets of information on a regular basis. There are so many more than five takeaways from today's episode. I I didn't really know where to start, but make sure you sign up for my newsletter. Link is in the show notes because you will have all of the takeaways sent to your inbox each and every week from each and every episode, in addition to a nugget on how to grow and build your own business. But for now, you're going to want to take out your pen and paper because I am going to share my top five takeaways from my conversation with Sally. Number one, you can reinvent yourself at any point. Number two, women have to invest in their own confidence. We have to understand the value of what we bring to the table. Number three, it took Sally a lot longer to get her first client than she would have expected or than and or than what other people might have expected as well. People want instantaneous success, but you have to be in it for the long haul. Number four, you will whittle down and refine what you offer over time. Pick a niche and start. Pick the lane and stay in that lane. You can always change it. Where people go wrong is they want to serve everyone in an effort to gain as many clients as possible. And number five, you want to be vulnerable. That was the number one comment that people shared when they read Sally's book, and it's what made her book rise to the top. Thank you so much, Sally Holder, for being here today. And thank you to everyone who listened to this incredible episode. Please make sure that you leave a rating or review if you like what you're hearing. We would love to hear from you. And as always, stay tuned for another episode of Dear Found Her coming your way every Tuesday and Thursday.